This video, Inside Biden's Cuba Policy, is a recording of an event featuring Cuban independent journalist and filmmaker Liz Olivia Fernandez, who is finishing up a national tour of the United States and was in Seattle on November 16, 2023. Viewers may remember Liz as the central character and narrator of the Belly of the Beast documentary film series, War on Cuba. The event was presented by Lilo, the Washington State Labor Council, and Women United for Peace and Justice, and opened with an introduction by Lilo activist and organizer Cindy Domingo. After the introductions, the latest documentary from Belly of the Beast titled Uphill on the Hill was played. We are sorry we can't bring you that now because it hasn't been released yet. It features Liz's quest in Washington, D.C. to get to the root and expose the political interests driving the U.S. government's Cold War era policy towards Cuba. A rousing discussion followed between Liz and the roomful of seasoned Cuban activists. Keep an eye out for Uphill on the Hill when it is released. In the meantime, enjoy this rare opportunity to meet Liz. I want to thank the sponsors tonight, and I just want to say a little bit about the sponsors and some of their work, um, and then introduce Liz, who you all came to see, and we're very honored. Liz and Justin, uh, uh, we're very honored to have them here today, and uh, great that they could work Seattle into their schedule, very busy national schedule uh, that they've had. So um, many of you are familiar with most of the groups that are co-sponsoring this, uh, U.S. Women in Cuba Collaboration, uh, who has just come off of a, you know, a, a weekend retreat a, couple a few weeks ago, uh, with targeting three campaigns, uh, Right to Travel, because we all really have the right to travel anywhere in this world that we want to, and Cuba remains the only country that we still need permission from our government to travel to. But many of you have not received permission and have traveled there anyway, which is great. <laughs> our second campaign, Advancing Global Women's Rights, and our third, The Reality of Cuban Women's Lives. And that's even why more so we're glad that Liz is here because we always want Cubans to be able to speak for themselves about what they think is happening in their country and to tell us also what we should be doing in our country to normalize relationships with our countries. Um, LILO, a Legacy of Equality Leadership and Organizing, has been around for 50 years, uh, working in different areas to give voice to workers of color especially and women workers in their community, in their workplaces, uh, and in their homes. Seattle Apala, Asian Pacific American Labor Alliance, uh, is a Seattle chapter. Eunice is back there clapping for her. <laughs> She's the president of Apala. <laughs> and uh, a great partner with Lilo, uh, a great group of young Asian women leading in the labor movement and in our community. Uh, they are the only national uh, API workers organization affiliated with the AFL-CIO. The Seattle-Cuba Friendship Committee, um, who has been around also for many decades, working to normalize relationships between, between our countries and lifting the blockade. And the Pacific Northwest Committee of the Vince Ramos Brigade, a, a, a new reemergence of the Vince Ramos Brigade in this area. Uh, some of you might have gone to Cuba with the Vince Ramos Brigade. Monica here went many years ago with my husband. And so now we have some young people leading uh, the Vince Ramos Brigade and working also to lift the blockade. And uh, one of the organizations that goes to Cuba and, actually, and does work alongside with Cubans. And they'll be going again in July, right, Nick? Yeah. So how many of you here have been to Cuba? Oh, <laughs> Liz. <laughs> okay, almost everybody. So, uh, you know, we, uh, as I said, we're very fortunate to have Liz Oliva Fernandez with us and Justin, uh, both with the Belly of the Beast, 
Liz is a filmmaker. So are you Justin, right? I'm not a filmmaker. Oh, you're not a filmmaker. <laughs> Justin is the uh, tour manager, but also speaks with Liz on any questions and dialogue you might have. Uh, but Liz, uh, if any of you have any of you seen Belly of the Beast? Okay, well, you're in for a treat. Liz is a big star, actually. <laughs> she's beautiful. She's very talented. She's a filmmaker. She's a journalist. And this is her second time in the United States. And we have taken advantage of her work, of her words, her experiences, to share with us about the reality of life in Cuba. You know, many of you have not, like myself, have not been there recently, have a lot of questions. Uh, but you know, obviously, we're here to also talk about U.S.-Cuba relations and what we can do in this country to change that policy. Cuba has been suffering even more so uh, under uh, not only the Trump administration, but the continuation of the hardening of the U.S. foreign policy by the Biden administration. I mean, many of us, obviously, were disappointed when Biden continued Trump's um, policies. And especially uh, Trump's policy around uh, keeping Cuba on the list of state sponsors of terrorism that, that Trump did it towards the very end of his administration, which continues to make life difficult uh, for Cubans and, and stops us learning more about uh, Cuba and their advances uh, in their own society. So, um, with no further ado, wait a minute. Oh. One, one more thing. <laughs> um, I'm going to pass this around, and if you're interested in the Belly of the Beast newsletter, uh, put your email, your name here. I'll just pass this around, and you'll get the newsletter to learn about you know, new releases of the documentaries and what's going on with Belly of the Beast. So, there you go. Thanks. Oh, oh Justin. Justin will, come. Justin will open up. <laughs> Hey, how's it going? Yeah, I gotta say I'm very disappointed in Seattle. Um, you know, all, all my life, everybody said, oh, you'll love Seattle. I love the rain. Everybody said, oh, you'll love Seattle. It rains all the time. We were for four days, it hasn't rained once. Um, we're, I also haven't seen any thrift shops, so I don't really get the hype. Um, but we're really excited to, to be here tonight. Um, you know, we're nearing the end of our national tour. This is our last stop on the West Coast before we head to the Southwest. Um, we've been almost everywhere. Um, so, it's, you know, it's been really long and it's, you know, it's always, you know, really warm and really nice to be received by rooms like this. Um, the film that you're about to see tonight is called Uphill on the Hill. Uh, for those that have seen The War on Cuba, um, you know, for those that haven't, it comes after a six-part series called The War on Cuba that covers the length and breadth of the U.S. economic war on Cuba and the blockade. Um, and this is, you know, sort of flipping that on its head, where you have, instead of, you know, the classic narrative of a journalist from the global north or from the west coming to the global south and, you know, doing a very short trip to figure out what's going on, you have someone coming from the global south um, to the global north in a very unprecedented way, a journalist from Cuba, um, you know, coming to the U.S., talking to people on the street, to people in Congress, city council, organizers, to try to figure out why, you know, these cruel policies remain intact and in place. Um, the film is currently unreleased, so it's about 90 to 95% done, so the version that you see when it is released may be a little bit different than what you see today. Um, it runs about 40 minutes long, and we'll have some time for Q&A afterward um, with Liz. Um, also have some merch over there. Um, you know, we've been driving a little bit across the West Coast. We're about to fly, so if you want to help us lighten our load a little bit, that'd be much appreciated. Um, I know Liz is really excited to get rid of the merch. Um, I don't because I do the display, so every time I lose an item, I'm like, oh no, like, how do I make it look nice now? Um, but yeah, we're really excited for you to be here. You know, we're going to watch the film, and, and then we'll have time for a Q&A. So. Huh? Huh? Oh yeah, so this film was actually paired with another film that was filmed when you were here in the spring called Hardliner on the Hudson. Um, and that film uh, chronicles the New Jersey political machine and Bob Menendez. Uh, not sure how much more there's to chronicle there. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, you know, be on the lookout for that one. That one is a little bit less finished, so that one may be coming later on. Um, but yeah, without further ado, you know, we can get started with the film. Hi, everyone. 
my name is Liz Olia Fernandez. I'm a Cuban producer and journalist. I work for Belly of the Beast. Belly of the Beast is U.S. independent media outlet who has collaboration between Cuban and all Cubans and also U.S. journalists. So our first work was, uh, we only exist from 2020, so only three years. Uh, but our first documentary was The War in Cuba that we chose the impact of the sanctions on the Cuban people because but at the time we never have the chance to show what drive the US policy the way it is and also who is behind that policy. So that's why we did up here on the hill this year and also Harlan and the Hudson that are our newest uh, film documentary. So now apart from all the questions that you have about the film or Cuba of policy. You, you can go. I have a question about your documentary and what kind of exposure it's been getting in the United States and if any Congress people are willing to watch it. Well, we already, uh, well, I was in, you have to remember that this is not uh, complete. This is a rough cut work in progress what that means that we are still working in this film and another that is coming so hasn't been being released yet so maybe when the film is released if you sign for the uh, newsletter the version is going to be a little bit different from this one but we already were part of the the people in congress have something called happy hour um, the, yeah, he said pro they, they have half a hour to, to talk about different issues about policy. Uh, so we having a really like being in touch with this. Uh, they always say that they don't have time to see the whole thing because it's 40 minutes. But it, they know about these films and also we participated in this, the last happy hour with a small fragment of the film. Um, and they know. About the field, they don't need to to watch the film of them to know what is happening because they having, I having been like having conversation with them during the spring and also like a, a lot of staffers involved too, uh, so they know. If the people in Washington D.C. knows, these people know better. The problem is they they are not able to do it, nothing. Because it's, Cuba is a polarized topic, so nobody wants to receive the backlash of like uh, taking parts about Cuba, uh, because it is always an election coming in this country. So, yeah. Is Bob Menendez's legal problems good for Cuba or <laughs> no effect? Well, I think that Bob Menendez out is good for everyone <laughs> uh, but this is not the first time that women in this I'm so sorry you're following me I'm like because I can move a lot, a lot. Um, this is not the first time that women in this is facing church against him so this is his third impeachment in his political life and let me say that it's just a few um, but I don't know, maybe he's going down. A lot of people say that this time he's going down, but I'm not sure, for sure. This is not like, a, okay, it's a country that characterized for doing justice all the time. So maybe Bowman and this is falling down, but it's also the cause, but also the excuse. So this government may be going to find another excuse in order to not do nothing to leave the sanctions against Cuba. Do you have a question? Yeah. Uh, it seems to me that the, the reason the United States ruling class doesn't uh, drop the embargo is because they're afraid of the Cuban Revolution and the example it sets for working people in the United States and around the world. But I was wondering what you, what you thought of that. I don't think that there's only one reason. But for sure, that may, may be one of the reasons they want to overthrow Cuban governments. They have like interest there. Um, they want to take Cuba back, and I always say that. Um, now my grandma has Alzheimer, but when she had like a, like 
able to do have a like, conversation with me, she always talk about how hard for her was like growing up in in the Cuba in the forties and the thirties. And uh, that she started to work when she had uh night when she was nine years old and she barely used shoes in the entire lives. Mm -hmm. So um if you are realize what is happening with Puerto Rico, what is happening with DR, what is happening with Honduras, El Salvador, Colombia, and the rest of the countries in Latin America, that you realize that the United States has been like a playing a role really uh, dangerous for the whole continent. Because, okay, they say that Cubans are fleeing from communism. So they are coming to Cuba, because, coming to the United States because they are fleeing from communism. So the people who are coming from these countries are fleeing from what? And that's the question. And they are not also only coming from Latin America, they are coming from the global south in general. So what has happened there? They have a social revolution too and nobody knows about that? What has happened? And what is also the role of Latin America? I, I was having to like have a conversation with Cindy because we never mentioned Philippines and what happened, but Cuba and Philippines has a really they, we have like a, a lot of things in common in our history. Uh, we were colonized for Spaniards. We were after that sales to the United States in a kind of interchange agreement between the two countries. And um, nowadays we have like a different struggles, but we are suffering from the same. So, do you have a question? Okay. How have you experienced like the haters and the viciousness and the backlash against the work that you're doing, and how have you handled that? So far, they. In this tour, and I was surprised about that. In this tour, I think that the only hater that I have to face in person because the rest is on YouTube <laughs> uh, was in Portland. Was in Portland, and I think he was a nice guy. <laughs> he wasn't so bad. He he came with. Um, it's because the people don't understand. Um, the most of them, there is a lot of missing information, and I don't know. I think that every case maybe is different, but he takes time to weigh me outside of the event to try to tell me like a lot of stuff. And in some point, he said something like, uh, "Freedom for the political prisoners in Cuba," and he said, "Of course, freedom," <laughs> and he was like so shocked, like. <laughs> he doesn't understand what is ha what was happening, and I, and I say, but because we need to uh, uh, like a, a fight against the dictatorship, so you're welcome to come back to Cuba with me, and we can fight. <laughs> and he was like, no, 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 I'm not coming back anymore. And I, it's like a, I don't have afraid of these haters if they're like a, welcome to have a conversation about Cuba. Uh, I want the best for Cuba. I really want. I want to build a better country without political prisoners in any ways, uh, without more social justice, um, in the country for everyone. Uh, but it's diff difficult sometimes to have a conversation with people like they say that they want a better Cuba, but they don't really because they are like wishing for a Cuba that is just for them and for the people who always has been privileged and always has been in power, always want to be the part of this story of the oppressors. So I'm a black woman. So I live in a marginalized neighborhood in Cuba. So I know what it's been like to spend your life in the other side of the story when you are being oppressed. Uh, your background and your history and everything around you. So this conversation has to be in the both sides. Because I don't care if you are worried about political prisoners in Cuba, you don't realize that the most of them from July 11 are black people. Are black people because they are angry, because they are frustrated, 
because they don't have any options, because they are tired to survive crisis after crisis, mm -hmm. scarcity after scarcity. If you look inside of Florida and the Cuban American community, what color Cuban American community mm -hmm. is? White. 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 So the white people leave the country if they have the opportunity. So white people are doing what? They have to stay there. Not because they don't want to try to pursue the American dream, it's because they don't have any actions. So the sanctions can be affecting less or more depending on your race, your gender, and your social class. So if you want to talk about that, let's talk about race inside of Cuba. Okay, go ahead. Hey, could you, um, thanks again for the film, it's wonderful. Could you tell us a little bit about what the current situation is in Cuba in terms of um, the impact it has um, on you know, banking, on getting hold of cash, and even like, for example, you come into the US, did you, did you have to fly to Mexico or something? Or? Uh, for the visa process, uh, the, the current situation in Cuba is pretty bad. I don't have any good news. In fact, I left Cuba October 1st, and that, that same week, uh, the government has been announcing like the situation is gonna be worse in the incoming months because it's just like you have to think there is like a, the economy in your home. Like it's sometimes getting to the end of the month and sometimes it's even more difficult to get to the end of the year. So that's Cuba. So October, November, December, they announced that they're gonna be in like a tough month in the year because we have had the opportunity to recover the economy after the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, before the, pan the COVID-19, we have been dealing with Trump and the punishing tourism, and they now they are punishing Europeans to come into Cuba. They are trying to, they are targeted. If we, because one thing that you have to understand is that the sanctions is not the same from the 60s to 2023. Uh, they have been changing, sometimes reinforced, sometimes they are made a little bit loose depend of the government, depending on the strategy of that government. So now it's pretty bad because not only the sanctions, the sponsor of terrorism list was a death sentence for Cuban people because it, it's already difficult for Cuba like a doing business, being sanctioned by the United States because we are doing business for is Burundi. The United States is going to put sanctions against Burundi because they are going business with us. In a few months ago, I remember that, well, Mexico has to receive a loan from the United States, I think like 80 million for something. I, I don't remember the, the amount of money, I'm so sorry. Don't, don't take the, the data. But it was a significant amount of money, uh, but United States now is, to, is saying that it's not giving the money to Mexico, because a month ago he was trying, he was selling us oil, fuel. So now Mexico, Mexican people has been punished because they are trying to sell us oil. So if they are doing business with Cuba, they can do business or whatever with the United States. So if you have to choose between an empire that is the United States, a small old island in the Caribbean that don't have any money to give you, like a, like a significant amount of money, but, but it makes you think about it, you're going to choose the United States. Even if you want to be solidarity and establish cooperation with Cuba. We produce in Cuba more than 80% of the medications that we have but we don't have the raw materials. So the raw materials, we have to buy it from pharmaceuticals around the world. And who has the biggest one, the closest one? United States. So it's almost impossible for us even produce our own medicine. So. You did ask me for quite a I'm so sorry, I didn't, I didn't. Well, I didn't hear any mention in the about the fact that the United States is a class divided country and that the uh, wealthiest families, which we call the capitalist class, are really controlling the government. And that's why there can be a total lie that the Cuban uh, politicians are controlling the U.S. government. It's the 
Rockefellers and the um, DuPonts and the other wealthiest families in the United States that are making decisions for Biden. And Biden uh, listens to them and not to uh, the working class, which is the other half of the society. We're, it's the U.S. working class that is being attacked in this society, but uh, they attack Cuba because they want to uh, keep people from hearing how well things were, and they want people not to hear how good things would be if Cuba was not being suffocated and having a, a horrible economic war um, waged against Cuba. So they're trying to set up a false picture of the benefits of socialism. Um, and it wasn't until um, Castro uh, had his revolutionary army set up small hospitals that the peasants in Cuba, even before the revolution, they started to have medical care. And uh, there was widespread starvation in Cuba earlier. So anyway, um, it, the people at fault in the United States are, are the wealthiest families. That's a question for, for you? I'm so sorry. Ah, that's, that's question. A, yeah. that, no, I'm so sorry. That's a question for you guys. Like, what are you doing with the, the democracy in this country? Because I can answer that, but I don't want it. Because this is not my country. I'm not coming here to talking about internal problems in the United States, but I, will, I have a lot of to say. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much for You're the welcome. documentary and for coming here and having the courage to uh, go to the Capitol and, and uh, speak uh, truth to power. And uh, I want to say I was in uh, Cuba a couple times, and recently I've, I've been to Puerto Rico. And your, your point about the people leaving Latin America and coming to the U.S. is, is graphically shown in Puerto Rico, which, which has been devastated not only by the hurricane, but by decades of U.S. exploitation and imperialist domination. So like Colonialism. Half the country is, has had to go to the U.S. And right now it's, it's even worse because of the hurricane and the lack of support they've gotten from the U.S. And the sanctions that they have in the terms of the economic control that the U.S. You know, appointed yeah. a control board. So they can't even determine you know, how, how to uh, run the country. It's, it's dominated by the U.S. You know, they, they, they want to shut down you know, half the schools. They've had big demonstrations in Puerto Rico just to keep the schools open. Yeah, and you also know. another phenomenon that you have here, gentrification. And so as far as his, his point goes, in every the, corner. the question to us, you know, what do we do? You know, we, we do the marches at, at the end of the month. Every, every month we have rallies where we pass out flyers to people on the street, tell them the truth about Cuba, try to you know, agitate against the embargo. And 90% and or 95% of the people support that. You know, only one or two people, you know, are, are uh, against, you know, stopping the, the uh, embargo or, or voice, you know, hostility to Cuba. It's very few. You know, yeah. Of course, it's different maybe in Florida, but, you know, or Miami, but, you know, the popular sentiment, you know, like, like he says, you know, working people are, are not against Cuba. You know, they, yeah, people know. recognize what Cuba's done. I know, um, I know. What other country in Latin America developed a vaccine for the COVID? You know, Haiti, you know, like they're, they're, you know, El Salvador, I don't think so. You know, it's like... It also, Haiti and El Salvador could develop vaccines for COVID. Yeah. The problem is the same, United States, because Haiti has been also under sanctions. And also, before the Cuban Revolution, you have to think about the Asian Revolution. So they have been punishing Haiti from since that. So it's complicated. And one, another thing that having think about that is like, okay, I know that there is a lot of solidarity with Cuba and people here, like a support in what is happening in Cuba and, and has empathy about Cuban people. But I realize if this country doesn't change internally, like structurally, it's impossible that the 
in, like a international policy will change without the change that we need like internally. So maybe you need your own revolution at this point. Okay, yeah. Okay. Oh, off topic, but maybe not. I love the shoes you were wearing in the documentary. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Where I did gotta tell my mom. <laughs> did you get them in Cuba? Of or? course. Of course. My, my I never green dress there, and everything. And I, I mean, you have stores and all that. I'm, I'm sorry, I've never been to Cuba. Uh, well, we have stores and everything. The most of them are empty. Uh, but we have, like, a really... Um, are empty because it's anxious. Let me clarify that because most of the country doesn't have the opportunity, the government doesn't have the opportunity to import nothing. Uh, Cuban don't produce nothing. The, it, like the same rest of the Caribbean island that we import uh, the most of the thing that we consume inside of the island. Uh, but for us, it's more difficult yet now, my shoes that you uh, <laughs> also love about uh, is from um, Artesano, how can I say that? Like a, now in Cuba, it's very artisanal. Artesanal, yeah. Now in Cuba, they are really good. They, they have a lot of entrepreneurs and a lot of people that are doing things handcraft. Is an artisanal mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. So, since I was in the university, I, I think my mom is a doctor. So doctors in Cuba don't earn a lot of money. Like the salaries are really low. Um, so she put a lot of effort and money to try to build me, um, to buy me a sandals for university. But in my first day of university, well, it was raining so hard that I just broke my sandals. <laughs> <laughs> and that was like a really bad because I was like a fancy sandals for my mom. So uh, someone recommend her to go to a small place in Havana Vieja when they were doing like artisanal shoes. And they were really cheap. And since then, I have been wearing artisanal <laughs> shoes my entire life. <laughs> so, and, and they are pretty good. And they are really high quality. And this is something that I really love about Cuba when we decide to do something with it, right? <laughs> it's not because the, the, the shoes is going like a broken, a, couple of weeks ago. No, this is just going to be forever <laughs> and ever. So it's, it, I, it's not all of my, my shoes. I was like, wearing two high heels and also boots because the weather. Uh, both were made in Cuba for artisanal people. Mm -hmm. um, I just use it a lot. <laughs> a lot. And I was like, I have to come back to Cuba and I was like, okay, I need to say goodbye to this boat because it's like a lot of bottles for them. <laughs> because it's, yeah, because it's art to all, not because they are broken. So this is something that I really love that because when you buy something here, the most of the time they have like obsolescencia programada. I don't know how to say that in English. Planned obsolescence. Huh? What's it mean for planned obsolescence? How can I say? Planned obsolescence. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, so because it's this capitalism, so they oh, want they yeah, broken yeah. to buy oh, new yeah. shoes and maybe one modern or whatever. So it's different. We make things in Cuba in order you can keep them for a long term because everybody knows that it's difficult for people there to pursue things, to buy things. So, okay, go ahead. I wonder if I could, oh, I'm sorry, were you? I don't know. I, say, I wonder if I could sort of build off of that question and sort of turn it into how are women in Cuba and maybe the diversity of women in Cuba being impacted by the sanctions and by the endless blockade? And are there ways in which we can support women in Cuba as well as all people, of course? Well, maybe the ways that you can survive, maybe you can talk about that because you have been doing like a lot of work. <laughs> but I'm so sorry. But I think that the women are the more impacted by the sanctions. I'm not talking about just for in the in the way that everybody's impacted about the sanctions. It's because the most of the women in Cuba are the head of the families. So they are taking care of the child, the children. And they also taking care of the elders, and they are also trying to manage homes. And how do you manage a home in a crisis? 
that requires like a mentality work 25 eight because you need to figure out how are you going to manage your small economy in a big crisis how you fit everybody in your inside in, 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 in inside of your home how you take care of the people if they get sick how you manage your time in order to be able to doing your normal work and also come back home and manage the situation home. So you are surviving a crisis outside of home in your own work. Because for example, healthcare system in Cuba is one of the most affected because of sanctions. The most of the people who work for, power, for healthcare system in Cuba are women. The most impacted sector is a, a um, public sector in Cuba. The most of the people who are there are women. And also, the most of the people who work for the public sector in Cuba are black people. So, education, another thing that is highly impacted by the sanctions, the most of the people who are in the education system are women. So, directly, we have been impacted in our professions, in our careers, but also at home. Because if you don't have food, you have to five eggs for 30 days in a month. What are you doing? You have two childs. And maybe your mom or your mother in law or whatever. How are you doing to manage? If now it's really hard for us, like a fine chicken, it's 2,000 pesos in Cuba right now because of inflation. And your salary is also 2,500. So, what are you doing in order to feed everywhere, like a giving? breakfast and lunch and dinner and and child's on vacation I was like I, I don't know how the families do it because in Cuba I remember myself when I was on vacation on these holidays days like I just worry and hungry worry and hungry the most of the time because as like the kid doing like when they're not, not doing nothing in the school they are also they are always boring they are always want attention or whatever and they are always hungry so what are you doing in that situation so i think that the women in cuba are like carrying the most of the the weight of the sanctions and trying to to do their best for the people in general but they are also exhausted because it's exhausted to have to manage the time and the economy in that way. So it's, it's, not, it's not like something easy, being a woman or a black woman nowadays in Cuba. So do you have a question? I'm wondering, is there ways that we can donate to people in Cuba? Of course, you, you can talk about that. Like in the way that you can support us and all the things. <laughs> there, there are a number of ways you can support Cuba uh, financially and materially. Uh, global health, uh, was it Go global partners? Global health partners is raising money to send anesthesia machines and sutures in the in the hospitals they no longer have a lot of functioning anesthesia machines. I mean, can you imagine <coughs> going into surgery and there's no machine that can help put you out, as well as sutures to help sew you up if they're yep. able to, to operate on you. So, so there's that. Uh, Puentes de Amor, uh, Carlos Lazo, who lives here in, uh, um, up in Shoreline Bothell, he raises money and brings powdered milk to children uh, to um, because there's a shortage of, of milk and obviously you know what happens when children grow up without calcium or pregnant women. So there are a number of ways you can do that on many of the delegations. They bring humanitarian aid, uh, small delegations or large delegations of its Ramos Brigade when we go as U.S. Women in Cuba collaboration. We're thinking about what are materials needed by women and girls, um, menstruation uh, pads, um, elderly women uh, who are going, <coughs> well, not just elderly women, but women in their <laughs> 40s and 50s going through menopause, you know, that thing, need, you know, AIDS to help them through that period of their life. 
reading glasses. Um, you know, so yeah. there's shortages of so many things that if you know Everything. somebody going to Cuba, send some items with them, uh, as, especially with uh, delegations who can bring more poundage uh, because they have more people going. Yeah, so I know. You're allowed to bring stuff like that in? Yes. Yeah, yes. When yeah. I bring, usually she's been trying to get me to bring it for a long time. That's why she kept saying she hasn't gone yet. Uh, yes, you can bring. You can bring. Of course, whatever. And also, the most basic medicines like ibuprofen, aspirin, because this is something basic that kill families. Do you have to declare it, or do they check your luggage? No, no, no. Sometimes they open your luggage, and we just say that it's humanitarian aid, and uh -huh. they let it through. Yeah. Here. In uh, no, in in Cuba, they'll sometimes they'll open it. Yeah, but you can you can whatever you want. And also, there's a lot of organizations in Cuba that you can be in contact. I can talk about uh, Centro Martin Luther King. Um, um, I, I I you just have to research um, on Facebook or whatever. You can connect with the people there and trying to bring whatever you can't in your suitcases. On vacation suitcases, yeah. full of medicines. And the U.S. Okay. Women in Cuba collaboration, we have connections with many women, and they tell us what, what they need. So you can always contact us for ideas. Yeah. Prenatal vitamins, there's so many things. Yeah. yeah, vitamins for kids and also for elders. Yeah, of course. Do you have a question, sir? So uh, you were talking about how the United States never changes, and I've kind of noticed that, too. And, um, you know, but the thing is, the United States might be forced to change because uh, they just slapped Russia with all these uh, sanctions and they thought that they could overthrow the government. And it didn't work. It backfired. And uh, so I was wondering if there's what people are thinking in Cuba about this, that the, as the unipolar world breaks down, is there hope that Cuba might get more the, the sanctions might be just evaporate, you know, with, uh, you know, uh, Russia and China and, and the uh, yeah. third world and everything. Well, yeah, that will be good. They just for Cuba, but everybody around the world, for the entire global south. But I think that this is most more difficult. I think that it, everything has to be start here uh, be, and have an impact because the idea is not like, okay, the United States now more longer in the picture. So who is, get, like, who is trying to get the role that the United States has been playing? Because this is like an empty spot that everybody was going to be happy and nobody was trying to reach and became the next United States. So it's a really future, like, um, I don't know, utopian, I don't know how to answer that in a way that is, can be certain because I don't know. I don't know what has happened, but I'm for sure we are going to have like more opportunities. So, okay. Yeah. Thank um, you. I'm so sorry that it took me so long. Good. No, no, sorry. Um, well, uh, my name is Janine. I'm from Vancouver Communities in solidarity with Cuba, and a few of us uh, came down from Vancouver, and we're really excited oh, to have the chance to see you and hear you. And, uh, and thanks for our friends in Seattle for hosting this. Um, I, I think a lot of us are Cuba solidarity activists um, and are constantly you know, talking to people about the US blockade. So some of the examples that you give about the US blockade just in the last few questions um, and in your, um, your films are really like tools for us to be able to do our work. So, I have a question and then a quick plug. Um, it, and my question is specifically um, producing Belly of the Beast. What are some of the, um, the issues you run into with the blockade that we might even not think about that, um, that you have to overcome just for producing Belly of the Beast? Um, so that's my question. And then I wanted to also let people know uh, about an important postcard campaign uh, that was initiated in Vancouver and many other groups have signed on to, including uh, the Seattle-Cuba Friendship Committee. Um, it is addressed to uh, Joe Biden and is asking um, uh, 
the U.S. government and asking Biden to take Cuba uh, off the state sponsors of terrorism list. Um, and I know you mentioned that in the, the, um, uh, the video that we just watched. Uh, but the, the, I think a lot of people know about the blockade and um, the state sponsors of terrorism list is just another layer of the blockade that we really need to, f to focus on because it's so, um, it, it so drastically impacts Cuba. So I think those are going around and um, yeah, that's all I wanted oh, to thank say. You. Thanks. If you sign one tonight, we'll put it oh, yeah. in the mail. We'll happily yes. take the stamp and put it in the mail. Thank you. That's amazing. Well, I think that Valley of the Beast is a U.S. independent media outlet, but we have an office in Cuba. So the people who work for Valley of the Beast, as myself, have to deal with the sanctions and be part of the sanctions every day. We are talking about, for example, if we are at a short shell of fuel and we want to do a production and doing some story, but we don't have a taxi or a cab or where it was impossible for us to get. Also, the people who work for Belly have families. So it's difficult. And for me, that's the most challenging thing because I grew up in crisis. I try to manage myself as, as like, the best way that I can. But I'm not alone. I have a lot of worries about my family, my mom, my grandma. So how can I just focus and work if I get distracted by worries about my own family? How can I focus and spend two months in the United States doing this tour if I, in my, in my mind, I'm thinking about my grandma and my mom? They're doing okay. They have enough eggs. They whatever. They have milk. If I, I can have a nice meal in the United States, I'm thinking, Oh, my grandma will love this cheese. I can't bring this cheese to Cuba to my grandma. So the most of the people who work for Belly are suffering the same. We get family that get sick and we don't have access to medications. How you focus on the work that you are trying to do if you are dealing with the scarcity of medication for your own family. It's hard because I think that we try to do the best and and when someone is really focusing someone in something, the result is better. But when you get distracted, you can't think clearly about what do you want, what are you doing as a journalist. So that's the biggest challenge. That's the biggest challenge for us. And we also have neighbors, relatives, family. And in Cuba, it's not all way, all, only your family. It's like the whole community is your family. Because the whole community helps you raise you. So maybe a neighbor that is in the next block and you know him the entire life and he's sick and he may be, uh, how can I say see a real chair? A real chair. I just, so sometimes at work, the chat for work is became the chat for resolving things for everybody. So if we, one of them is like, oh, I need a real chair for my neighbor, and everybody's trying to mobilize, so trying to get, so that's belly of the beast too. Because I don't talk about equipment that is also difficult if the equipment is broken, how we, but our boss is from the US, so he has this freedom to travel back and forth but it's not only, it's just, he's part of the community and he's also, I think that at this point, he better leave, travel to the US because he doesn't feel like pretty welcome here. <laughs> he loves Cuba, uh, but he also has been learning how to manage himself in crisis. And also he has been living in Haiti, in Gaza, in the Middle East, East so he knows. And um, I think the whole thing about this um, war for belly of the bees, because I'm, in, I'm a Cuban journalist. I want to focus myself in Cuban problems, Cuban government, and Cuban people. I don't want to focus myself in talking to a US audience and educate the people around the world about this topic, because I'm a Cuban journalist. I have my own things that I want to visualize in Cuban media. 
So, but working for belly of the beast, everybody understands that the sanctions is so big. And so have has a huge impact in the life of the people who live there that we need to get away of the sanctions in order to focus on our internal things, internal problems. So the things, a war that for me was like only three months, that became a war for three years. I'm uncounted. And I'm counting because the reality is that the sanctions is, going, is not going to end in a near future. So I'm tired, I'm exhausted. I have been living in my suitcase for almost two months now. Um, but I think this is important because that's the way that we create conscience about this topic. That's the way we educate people. That's the way that we try to visualize our war, but also the war that people have been doing. Solidarity with Cuba so long in order to get people because they are also how, how long have you been doing this work? Since 1999? Yeah. So I'm pretty young. I think <laughs> it is. I just three years I'm doing this work. <laughs> <laughs> no, you are also pretty young, but you are like you have more experience as activists. And also, I'm a journalist. I'm not an activist. I'm a political activist, but inside of Cuba. So I'm here like a journalist, but I can call for an action in a country that is not my country. These people are calling for an action. <laughs> it was a pleasure having this conversation with all of you. Yes, Liz is exhausted from her trip, and we hope that she'll soon come back one day. Um, so, but she got to see a little bit of the city today, so uh, and it didn't rain. So um, you know, we just want to end with uh, what you can do again. Um, you can, you know, the postcards that the Vancouver folks have launched a campaign around. Uh, call Biden and our congressional de delegation to remove Cuba from the list of state sponsors of terrorism and lift the blockade, both the senators and the House of Representatives. We can start working on Kilmer's replacement. Uh, maybe it'll be uh, Hillary Franz to make sure that she has the correct position on Cuba. Um, Call Pramila Jaipal. Uh, Rick got, Rick Harwood got her to admit that she wants to go to Cuba, uh, but she's been stalling. <laughs> and it, wasn't, it wasn't just that, but at a town hall, she was talking about the progressive agenda that the Progressive Democratic Caucus had put together for this coming session, and she didn't mention Cuba as one of the things. And I asked her about that, and she said, oh yes, we're going to make sure that that's on there. I said, are you going to go to Cuba? And she said, as soon as I can find time to go, I'll go. <laughs> so even people that we think don't need the pressure, need, we need to continue to, to call and write and pressure them to, to do something, not just give it lip service. Right. Uh, and we continue to, whenever there's a letter around lifting different sanctions against Cuba or the blockade itself, we have to pressure them to be co-sponsors, both at the Senate level and the House level. Uh, donate tonight, if you haven't already, or if you want to donate even more so that we can do more tours with Belly of the Beast and continue to bringing people uh, to Seattle. Um, we actually, in February, are going to be honored to bring the ambassador who you saw on the video, uh, Ambassador Lianis Torres uh, Rivera the first uh, woman ambassador from Cuba to the United States, and she's really great. She's done a couple of webinars with us on the advancement of women's issues in Cuba. She's coming on February 21st and February 22nd. On the 22nd, we're, well, on the 21st, we're working on a community forum, and on the 22nd, uh, we're working with the University of Washington Women's Center and the Department of Latin American Caribbean Studies to host a dialogue with her at one of the large halls. Um, so uh, hopefully you'll hear more about that. And as uh, many of you have indicated, you've gone to Cuba, go again to Cuba. <laughs> yeah, that's um, the best and, way. Yeah. <laughs> you, and, you want to send Cuba? Yeah, so go with one of the organizations that have been going. Um, 
the Vancouver folks at the Che Guevara uh, Brigade. Uh, Nick has, is with the Pacific Northwest Vince Ramos Brigade Committee. Uh, we're going in March, um, a small women's delegation. Um, and I'm thinking about, if anybody's interested, I'm thinking about doing a, a May Day delegation to march in uh, the May Day. Uh, well, you don't get to march in May, you get to watch. <laughs> but uh, a lot of times there's like a million, if, depending on the, the conditions and the gasoline. I've been in Cuba where there's been a million people marching uh, in Havana. So it's really exciting to be at if you're able to participate then. So uh, with that, I think we're going to close. Um, unless people have any announcements. No announcements. Okay, I hope to see you again in Cuba. <laughs> <laughs>